Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and of wonder to change our world. The heart of the National Geographic community is of course our explorers. National Geographic explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers and powerful storytellers. These Explorer Classroom events connect students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended <coughs> Q and A's. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern in addition to our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow for another great event. But today, we're very lucky to be connecting with Rosamira Guy Guillen, excuse me, Rosamira Guillen, um, to learn all about cotton top tamarinds. She's this amazing explorer, um, one of my heroes, if I may say so myself. She's an amazing conservationist, <laughs> she's got so much to teach us. But before she does that, I would like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several student groups and we have over 1300 students registered to watch along live today. It is Ooh. so great to have so many of you here. Today we've got groups joining in from across the US and around the world. We have students from Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Ooh. Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, Washington, DC, Wisconsin, Australia, Cameroon, Canada, Ghana, Guatemala, India, Jordan, Malaysia, the Netherlands, Oman, Romania, Russia, South Africa, Ukraine, and the United <laughs> Kingdom. You guys are really making me Ooh. work. Tell your friends we're missing, what, Wyoming and lots of countries, um, New Mexico. <laughs> Spread the word about Explore Classroom. See how long you can make me talk for at the beginning. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of you already active in the chat bar. I think you're great. It's so lovely to see you. There's a couple of shout outs that it, I, it is my honor to give. I want to give a shout out to Abby, the Ali Manu Middle School. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. I'm sorry. Um, Anderson County High School Zoology Program, Brown Elementary, Brookings School District, Kara from Miss S's class, the Haywood family, Jeanette and Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah um, the Kid Conservationists, the Los Angeles Zoo, Loudoun Valley High School, Mrs. Zucker, the Portugal Boys, uh, Swift River School, Tiana Sermons, the Trotsky Science Students, the Yes Charter Academy, and the Zoo Academy. And that is now officially plenty from me. It's finally time to turn it over <laughs> to Rosamira for today's Explore Classroom lesson. Thank you so much, Celeste, and hi, you guys. I am very happy to be here with you today, and I am very impressed that we have a very large audience from all over the place. So thank you for being here. I, I am very proud and honored to be uh, called an Agile Explorer. Um, being part of this network is, is really amazing. Uh, you, we learn from each other. We uh, help each other and, and it's just so amazing to share stories. So I'm very happy to be here and thank you uh, for, for sharing this time of your day with us. Uh, so I'll go on to screen share, right? So we will be talking today about cotton top tamarinds. So I was, wonder, I was wondering if, if you guys have heard from this uh, species and if you have, how big do you think they are? They look pretty big on the screen. So um, anyone let's, wanna? Let's see how big Hannah and Lily think they are. Hannah and Lily, how big do you think that is? Um, maybe like a couple inches. <laughs> <laughs> they look. <laughs> Close enough. Well, let me see. Okay, so. Um, Uh, not so little, but still little, about the size of a squirrel. Here it is. Here's my friend, uh, crazy hair, as you can see, but they are just about the size of a squirrel. Maybe a couple of inches is the baby that is in the back. 
That's when they're born, they're very, very little with a long tail though, look at that. The tail is almost the size of their body. So it's really impressive. And they use it just for balancing when they're jumping out from one tree to another in the forest. But cotton tops is the species we study. Um, and I wanna ask you to, they're very little now, as you know, but they are very, very much similar like humans. Why do you think that that is? Who wants to think, how can cotton tops be so much similar to humans? What do you think? Why don't we see what Lily and Claire think? Lily and Claire, why don't you turn on your microphone Great. and Great give us a guess? <laughs> oh, you guys are still muted. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, what do you think about what? What do you think about what? Why do you think they're similar to humans? Or how do you think they're monkeys. similar to humans? Um, how do you think they're similar to humans, the monkeys? These little monkeys. Because they have <laughs> Maybe, I think because most gorillas act a lot like humans and are very intelligent. And so monkeys are kind of from the same family. Yes, that's right. They are, we're primates, huh? right? We're all primates. And our social behavior is very similar. In this case, cotton top tamarins live in families just like we do. So, so there's a mom and a dad and kids. And once a year, the mommy has two babies. Usually it's two once a year and everybody in the family helps care for the babies, just like we do. You know, we help with our brothers, with our uh, you know, siblings and, and help each other, right? Um, another way uh, cotton tops are very much similar like humans is like the babies learn everything from their parents. They learn how to talk, how to, what to eat and what not to eat, how to move around the forest. Look at that baby there in the back of that. Look how we, <laughs> they're helping each other care for the babies. They do have a language. They communicate with little chirps and they have different chirps for when they're nervous, for when they're hungry, uh, when they whine, they do whine like, you know, sometimes we do. Um, and um, they, they also have, uh, they're very territorial like we are. So like we live in our houses, right? And we don't let everybody go into our houses. We care for our houses and we keep everybody, you know, any, anyone who's not invited, we keep them out. Um, and we care for each other. Like if there's any threat or any issues, we do care for each other. So cotton tops are very much like our human family. Something else that is also similar is like when the babies grow like teenagers, we can say, um, or juveniles, they leave home. They go find the mate, um, boy cotton top or a girl cotton top, depending, and they become, make their own family, find their own territory, and they <clears throat> become another family, just like we are. So there's a lot of similarities, even though we're different in size. Well, some of us can have crazy hair. Some of us have white hair, also like cotton tops, right? But they do look like, you know, little Einstein. So something else that's very important, it's very nice to know about cotton tops is why they are important in the forest. And these little fruits that you see there is the, the reason that they have such an important role in the forest. They eat a lot of little fruits. They also eat insects and they also eat uh, little sap from the trees. But this, uh, this is their main, very important role. And they eat these seeds, they eat them all, they swallow them. And the little seeds come out of the poop. When they poop, and they poop a lot in the day, like four or five times. When they move around the forest, then all those little seeds come out like trees. So they do help make the forest, keep the forest healthy, and keep lots of trees for themselves. So they do have a very important role. They also are food for other animals. I don't like those other animals that much. They are the boa snake and the raptor bird. And I like cotton tops better, but that's part of the natural chain. So it, it's the balance and the equilibrium of the forest. And so they're very smart, like uh, Lily and Claire were saying, and they kind of hang out in, in, you know, not too high for them to be eaten by a raptor bird or not too low to be eaten by a boat snake that may climb up a tree or so. So they keep kind of like in the middle of the forest. But besides all these amazing and fascinating things about these little monkeys, one of the most, most amazing things is that 
They are so unique because you see how big our planet is. And then that red little dot is the only place on Earth that you, you will find cut and tough tamarinds, nowhere else. And you see the little map of our country at the bottom left of the screen. And then you see the little black spot. Within Colombia, that is the only place where you find cut and tops in the wild. So they do have a very restricted area where they live. And that makes them very, very unique and very special. Not only for all Colombians, but everybody in the planet having these unique species that we all need to care for and, um, and, and, and protect. So unfortunately, and you may, this, you may know this for many, many animals, uh, they're facing such terrible threats, right? In the case of the cotton tops, it's their forest. Since they live in such a small place, the forest is disappearing for cattle ranching, agriculture, mining, building houses, building roads. And that is making that the, the forest for the monkeys shrinks and shrinks. And it's become islands of forest here and there within that black spot that you saw. Some, some other threat that, that is very, very sad is that they are hunted uh, to be sold on the pet trade. Uh, you see, they're very, very cute and the hair is just amazing. They're very charismatic, uh, but they are unfortunately hunted to be sold on the pet trade. This has made cotton tubs be one of the critically endangered animals that we have in Colombia and around the world, of course. Um, there's only about 7,000 left, but the most important or critical thing is that the habitat is down to 2%. So that is like if you, you know, you live in a big house and then you start taking out parts of the house and you're clumped crumb, crumb up to the bathroom. That's all you have left. And then it's very critical for the monkeys to have a lot of space because they're territorial and they live, you know, uh, expanded in the forest. So that's what I do. That's what our team us here in Colombia is to work so hard to protect this monkey. And we do that by different, different things. We're doing a lot of different things. These four things that you see on the bottom are our main programs. So we do research, we do forest protection, we do education, and we do community work. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about uh, each one of these programs, and then you can ask all the questions you want at the end. Um, but one of the most important things that have taught us so much that we know about cotton tops is the field research. So you can see here, this is one of the animals we study. He has like a little backpack, right? That is a transmitter. That transmitter senses a signal that here's Felix, one of our assistants, and Francie, one of our biologists. With that antenna, they receive the signal of, of the little backpack that the daddy in the family group has so they can find him. And that is very important because they're very little and they hang up, up in the trees. And then, you know, it's not easy to see them. I don't know if, if you can spot them there, but it's not easy. There they are. So we do need technology. We do need tools to be able to find them in their homes every day. And then going back to that uh, the other slide, there's Francie has an iPad there. We have an app. And with that app, we call the TT app. TT is the Spanish name for the cotton top tamarind. So we call it a TT app. And in there, we type out everything they do, what they eat, um, how they behave, who's there, who's not, uh, if there's babies once a year, and so on. And we have, so we have a lot of information that has helped us learn how these monkeys behave and what they need to survive. And what they need to survive is for us to protect their forest. So we do this in a very different, you know, a few different ways. So we have uh, areas that we're buying to protect as a forest. So like this beautiful place that you see here, uh, they do live in a tropical forest, but it's different from the one in the Amazon that we know so much about because this one is a tropical dry forest, which means that half of the year is completely dry and half of the year rains a lot and you see this lush, beautiful green uh, forest as there is. And the other thing we're doing to protect the forest, remember I told you how uh, forest is left like with islands. Well, cotton tops never come down to the ground because if they do, they may get eaten by a bull snake, by a small mammal, right? So they, if they get isolated in one of those, those islands, it's like if 
if we were there and cannot go to the other island, if there's a you know handsome young cotton top that wants to meet a handsome uh, female cotton top, they cannot see each other. So we are creating corridors. We call them forest corridors, which would be like bridges if we were talking about islands. And we plant a lots of trees in these little yellow areas so that in the future, cotton tops can go and have like highways to go from one place to another. And we do that by working with the local farmers. I'll tell you why. This is what happens when you see it like from the ground. If you cut the trees, then the cotton tops that are on this side cannot get to this other side. So it's very important that we connect the forest and there's continuity so you can move around as you want, right? And we do that working with the local farmers. So farmers have their land, but they have very little money. They struggle a lot to make a, a living. So we decided to uh, make an agreement with them and say, okay, uh, you need support, you need seeds, you need equipment. How about if we do an agreement where uh, you set aside a little stripe of your land, we plant forest there, and in turn, we help you plant mangoes, plant bananas, plant yuca, yame, and all sorts of things that will feed your family and will also uh, give you uh, an income from selling these products that everybody needs. They have poultry, they have honey uh, uh, also that they harvest. So their economy increases and they commit to leaving these pieces of forest for cotton crops. And then we come and plant trees in these corridors so that they can grow in. Probably in eight to 10 years, it's what it's going to take to have that big forest that uh, we would love for cotton tops to be uh, moving from here to there and, and free to do that. Uh, this is Salvador, one of the uh, campesinos with uh, the farmers. You see how fast, because here in Colombia, where we are, it's hot and it's humid. So things grow really fast. <laughs> and then you plant a tree on one year and the next year it's already two, three times the size. So that's pretty cool because that helps the forest uh, recover really fast. So we've been doing that. Look at that. That's what we want. We want cotton tops being able to move from tree to tree and make those bridges that help the cotton tops uh, move around. That's very important. So more habitat and also more corridors. But we, we do talk about cotton tops. That's our favorite species and that's who you know, we work for. But when you're protecting the forest for cotton tops, you're protecting the forest for all of so many other amazing species that live in the forest with cotton tops. These beautiful macaws, you saw lots of birds, lots of birds. Colombia is a country with more diversity of birds you know, from the planet. So lots of birds, lots of mammals, even you know, creatures that, that, little creatures all over. So we're saving the forest for the monkeys, but we're saving the forest for everybody that lives in, in there, right? And not only for animals and, and, and plants, we're also saving it for ourselves because forests are like sponges that capture the water and keep it there for when we need it. So when we go to the river, we have water. When we want to take, you know, a fun, you know, splunch at the rain, we can enjoy that and also have it for drinking and for cooking. Think about everything you need water for every day. So saving the forest protects cotton tops, protects our wildlife, but it also helps us and protect us. Because besides water, we also have food and we have wood if we use it wisely and if we use it sustainably. So that takes us to our work with the people because we really want our communities to understand that saving the forest is good for us too. It's not only for the monkey. So that when it comes to our education programs, we really make it fun for the kids. So um, this is one of our programs for elementary school we do puppet shows and commit the, the main message here is cotton tops are not good pets we want them to understand that there's animals that need to stay in the forest and there's animals that can be with us like dogs so we have programs that encourage kids to have dogs cats and, and domestic animals and we want them to understand that cotton tops and macaws and all these other animals need to stay way in the forest they don't need us they're happy there they're with their families they have food, they have shelter, and they don't need us. They need us to stay home and care for our domestic animals. So we teach that, and kids, kids get it, get it, get it. And we want them to teach our parents, too. So we make it fun, and we make it, it enjoyable. Then there's a program for kids in secondary school. And these get to go to the forest and see the monkeys and see the translators and see the antennas and see all the amazing trees 
beasts and animals that are there. And that makes a love connection. So after the kids go through all of our programs, you know, they also have fun with it. They make shows, they make dances. We celebrate the day of the cotton top. These are curly uh, cotton tops, but <laughs> we didn't find wigs that had the hair just like that. So we use this curly one. So, but this is fun. They enjoy. And that way, I mean, I, I know you guys can relate. It's fun when you understand, when and you commit to helping by enjoying also making songs, making art. And then some of these kids that go through our programs become our leaders in, in other places. Like Nelson, he, he started with us when he was 12 years old. You can see him there with his little hat and his, uh, his uh, kid face. And now he's a young, uh, 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 young professional that works in one of the biggest zoos in Colombia. And he teaches others about cotton top and he shares his passion with us. He all learned it from our education program. So we're very proud of Nelson and we keep in touch with him all the time. Or like Rosa and Rosa, she went through all of our programs and now she's a teacher. She teaches this, the kids in her community about cotton tops and everything, everything she learned. So we know that when we're making it fun for the kids and, and for you guys, we leave like little seeds that grow, like, like the, they grow in the forest, you know, and they really make you uh, understand and want to commit and want to help. But we also need to help their parents because what happens is that people who hunt animals and who uh, cut the trees, it's because they need to eat. eat. People in rural communities in Colombia have it really hard. They have very you know, few jobs. Uh, they struggle to get food and to, to make a living. So we have to come up with ideas to give, give to these people. In this case, this is uh, beautiful handbags. Guess what they're made of? You are not gonna imagine, plastic bags. <laughs> we collect plastic bags before they go into the dump and the ladies cut them in threads and crochet like grandma crochets with wool or with fabrics. And they make these beautiful, amazing handbags that have become a fashion thing here in Colombia and, and many other places that we take them. And they have a story behind each one of them. And it's all to help cotton top tamarins. And there's also the little plushies that the ladies also make and they sell in different shapes, forms, sizes. And that's also with a message that do not have cotton tops as a pet. Cotton tops, you can, you want to have a cotton top? There it is. There's a plush here. And no, no live animals. <laughs> and then our, our other community programs is for recycling. So besides reducing pollution, we make something useful out of it, such as grinding this plastic and making fence posts so that we can reduce the amount of trees that get cut to make fences in the rural areas in Colombia. So all of those programs are uh, focus on helping people and helping the kids and helping the communities to connect and to appreciate cotton tops. And cotton top is the ambassador. It's the it's the symbol. It's uh it's uh the like the the spokes uh, animal for a whole ecosystem that we're trying to protect. So I invite you guys to check out our, our uh, social media at Proyecto TT in in all those uh, networks and and learn more if you if you want or connect with us. Uh, and I want to acknowledge our team. These are the people that do all of those fun things that we do every day. And thank you for being here today and for listening. And I'll be happy to answer any kind of questions you have. Well, the thanks need to go right back to you, Rosemira. That's amazing. What a wonderful example of how many different ways there are in this world to make a difference. Just, yeah. just incredible. Um, for folks learning along at home, you, we, we'd love to know uh, what about today has inspired you. Maybe you're going to do a follow-up activity from our family guide or our educator guide. Maybe you're just going to draw a picture or write a story <laughs> about that. Whatever it is, we would love to see it. Um, if you send it to us on Twitter by tagging at NatGeoEducation and using hashtag Explorer Classroom, we can make sure Rosamira gets a chance to see all of your amazing work. But now it's everybody's favorite time. Now it's time for questions. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can send us your questions in the chat bar. <laughs> you have already started sending them in. They're great, keep them coming. You do only need to send your question one time. We keep track of them as they come in. So please only send it once. And if you're up on screen with me, get ready with a nice loud voice. We'll start asking you questions in a second. Our first question comes to us from a couple different people. Kid Conservationist and Kasha among them are, are wondering, um, 
if the cotton tops ever lived anywhere else, if it's always only been Columbia or, or if maybe their habitat was destroyed and they used to live in more places? Well, as far as we know, and all of the research that came before us, they have only uh, been seen and found in this region of Colombia. There's other tamarinds. There are, uh, I believe, about 16 different species of tamarinds. But this one with the crazy hair looking like Einstein, it's only found in that little stripe of Colombia. The, the interesting thing is that uh, this area, this black area you saw on the map, is all bordered by water. So rivers and the ocean, right? So I'm guess, you know, when, when it evolution, they just got, you know, bound in there and they never come down to the ground. They don't swim. They don't, uh, they stay in their forest and they got bound in there. So uh, not that we have records that they have ever been anywhere else but Colombia. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that answer. Let's move to a question from Hannah and Lily. Um, so you talked about how they have a drastic changes in rainfall from one point to another. How do the, uh, what do the tamarins adaptate, what adaptations that do the tamarins have to deal with that? Yes, they usually lose a lot of weight on the, on the dry season because there's no water, so there's no fruits. <laughs> but they do are smart and have adapted by eating a lot of insects in the dry season. So they love crickets, they love little uh, worms, uh, and they also feed on, on um, there are trees in this forest that release like sap, like resins, and it, it, listen to this. So the woodpecker comes and peck, 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 pecks on the tree, and that tree then starts bleeding kind of, you know, resins, and then they come in and start licking and licking and licking. But that has a lot of energy. It's very sweet. They love sweet stuff. So they eat a lot uh, on that and they eat insects and anywhere, anything else that comes there, they feed. They lose weight. They lose weight, but then they make up for it. When it rains, you can find them eating a lot. And there's also, uh, they also have nectar from flowers. And, and we have a lot of fun in November, December, because they, they, they love to have the nectar of this vine. But that vine has to have some narcotic because they are like, you know, sleepy all day. They go easy going. They kind of look at us and don't pay any attention to us. So it's funny. You know, we would love to make a, you know, kind of find out what is it that this uh, flower has. But they love sucking it and they get the pollen in their face. So their face is like red. <laughs> but yeah, they do find ways to feed and, and, stay, and stay active and, and alive, right? Brilliant. All right, Kathleen Harris on YouTube is wondering how wide a wildlife corridor needs to be in order to work. What? I'm sorry, Celeste, I didn't get that. What is it? How wide do your wildlife corridors need to be in order to help the cotton tops? The, the life, the uh, size of the territory? Yeah, yeah, like big or okay. small, how big? Okay, so we have documented anywhere from five hectares to 20 hectares. So five hectares would be like 15, uh, like, like 12 acres, and then 20 hectares would be like 50 acres, right? Uh, so it depends on the size of the fragment of forest where they live. So the big, the larger, the, the area of, of the island of forest, the, the bigger the territories. But if you have a small uh, fragment, then their territories are smaller. But they are pretty big if you think about, you know, 12 acres for a family group of, five to seven individuals. Sometimes it comes up to nine, um, but yeah, it, it, it's a lot of space. Uh, a slightly less hard hitting question, but equally important. We've got Laylin who's wondering if it's possible to buy one of those cotton top stuffed animals. <laughs> Where yes, would you do that? You can. <laughs> yes, if you guys are in the state, you can go at projectotiki.com. And there's a shop button. We keep uh, stock in the U.S., so it'll be a domestic delivery, and you would make a great contribution to the ladies that live in their communities and their families because that's the way they get an income, and you'll be in love and will sleep with it, and you can do his care and everything. Yeah, so thank you. So if you guys had some an amazing way, you can also buy the uh, eco mochilas, we call them, 
the handbags that have uh, made with recycled plastic. And uh, so just go in and hit the shop button at the top right of our website, and then you will find all the things that, all the ways that you can help. You can also donate there if you want to make your contribution to our work. Amazing. Let's see if Lily and Claire have a question. Your microphone's on. Okay. Okay. Um, we were wondering, you said they had kind of like traveled in like families or groups. Um, like how many are kind of in like a family? Yeah. That how like many are usually together? in a group? Yes. So the, are the families that we, we have studied are usually five to seven uh, individuals in a group. So se seven cotton tops. Uh, sometimes we've gone, we've seen it gone up to nine, 10, but on the bigger territories, on the smaller territories, they usually five, seven. And, and again, it's usually mom, dad, and siblings in, in the family group. The, there's always one, one uh, of the siblings that is always watching out for threats. So like if they see a raptor bird coming, they start making one of their alarm calls and then mommy says, okay, let's go this way and let's find a shelter here. And they do, right? And then the others are just playing around and it's kind of a fun life because they do get up in the morning. They only are awake in the, in like, like us, you know, they're diurnal. They get up early in the morning, they find food, they play a little and take a nap. And then they go find more food, play another while and then take another nap. And then find more food, play for a while and take another nap. And that's a fun day in the life of a cotton top tamarind while they move within their territory. So they do feed a lot. They, they also help reforest a lot with their little poop. And, um, and yeah, so, so when the babies grow, they leave, they find another group and then create their own family. So that's more or less how it works. Amazing. Now I have something else to be jealous of. I'm not just jealous of their awesome hair. I'm jealous of their awesome schedule. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Rosamira, we have so many people, Bradley, Erica, Gareth, and some others who are all wondering on YouTube, how long do cotton tops usually live for? What's their average lifespan? Okay. In the wild, uh, we have seen an average of seven years, more or less, five to seven years. Uh, in captivity, they can live longer. You know, animals, when they are like in zoos or conservation centers, they don't have threats with regards to predators, right? So they can live longer and they don't struggle for food either. But in the wild, you know, it's normal that they do um, live anywhere between five to seven years. Though, though one of our study groups, we were able to study one female that was the mommy of this group, 17 years she lived in the wild. She was very strong. She was very tempered. And she was very rough. She would not, you know, nobody would mess up with her. She was the mom. <laughs> and she was, was able to, you know, make it through 17 years. But that is not common at all. The regular uh, lifespan is for anywhere from five to seven in the wild. Awesome. And Rosamira, do cotton tops have any particular tree that they like better than others? Elijah's wondering if they have a, a special tree they prefer to live in. The uh, uh, oh, the trees? Uh, yes. Well, they do feed from about 40 different trees, even if it's the fruit or the sap that comes out of the bark or, or the nectar of the flowers. So their diet is, is, very, is very wide, but um, they do love the, the, the sweet ones. You know, the, we have tasted all those, those fruits. <laughs> we do taste them and we know that the ones that are sweet, they love when they come. And that nectar I was telling you about, they love that nectar. They love that nectar. So we know that's the sweet thing. They do have a sweet spot. So it's like us with chocolate and, you know, candy. Brilliant. Let's take a question from Sabina. Does climate change affect the cotton top tamarinds? Yes, Sabina, we are studying that a lot as part of our research because you know how the climate uh, patterns are changing. Sometimes, some years we're having extended dry season and some years we're having the opposite, extended rainy season. When the dry season extends, that puts a lot of stress on cotton top tamarinds because the food food takes longer to bloom from the trees. They, the trees in the tropical dry forest 
a lot of them lose their leaves like you guys do in, in the fall, right? In, in the US or in the colder climate, they lose the leaves so they don't have to use energy. And they, the leaves don't come out until you start raining. So if the rains take longer, then they will have less food and that will affect them. But something else that is very important is that, and, and thank you, Sabina, for bringing that up, is that the females get pregnant during the rainy season because there's a lot of food. So their fertility goes up and they become very fertile and they get pregnant. And the babies are born six months after. Uh, it's the pregnancy last six months. So if the dry season extends and there's no food, they lose the ability to reproduce and keep you know, their life going in their normal cycle. So if we do have these patterns changing, then it will help, I mean, it will uh, damage their, their natural uh, biology and their ability to reproduce and the ability to feed themselves. So yes, we are still studying that. We're studying climate patterns. We're studying reproduction patterns and crossing that up with uh, climate and, and the babies that are born and what they're eating and all of that. And that's part of the science we do every day when we study the monkeys in the forest. Brilliant. Celeste, I wanted, I wanted to add something when you asked about the trees. Uh, there's there's a certain trees that are very important for cotton top tamarins. The larger trees, the big trees that you saw in some of those pictures, that's those are, the trees where they sleep at night because those usually have thorns. So it, it avoids predators to come in and eat them when they're sleeping at night. So there needs to be tall trees in the forest so that they can stay safe. Otherwise they become you know, eatable by predators. So cool. They're using like thorns the way I lock my door at night. So neat. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Yes. Uh, Eva That's right. In Wisconsin and Eva must have heard you compare cotton tops to squirrels at the beginning because Eva's wondering if they're around people a lot, do they come steal your food? Do they get used to, to people and adapt to that as a food source? Um, we, we have seen that in zoos. So, so it seems like cotton tops, um, you know, they, they do adapt easily to, to captivity doesn't mean that it's right or they're in, they're in their best uh, environment, but they do adapt to captivity. They actually, uh, they are very popular in zoos all around the world. And I'll tell you why. It's because they were used, cotton top tamarins were exported from Colombia in the 60s and 70s to the US for biomedical research on colon cancer. And they adapt so well to captivity that when the research stopped, all of those animals went to zoos and they reproduce well in zoos. They can live long lives in zoos. And sometimes they do get used to um, people and then they get a little mischievous and uh, come very close to people and they can do that. But again, that is not their natural behavior. That is not uh, the best condition for them. We love to see them in the wild, free, with their families, eating what they're supposed to be eating and hanging out in the trees like they're supposed to be doing. So, yeah. Awesome. We've got some students in New Hampshire wondering if there's a special word for multiple cotton tops, like a gaggle of geese or a murder of crows or a school of fish. What do you call a group of cotton tops? Um, a, a family. I don't think there, there is a, a, a name. Uh, Maybe uh, a bunch of cotton tops, maybe <laughs> uh, a gang of cotton tops. No, there's no, there's no, no. Not that I know there's a terminology for that, but it's, it's much, I mean, actually a, a family structure is more like it because that's the groups of tamarins are always organized by hierarchy. So uh, it would be a different, it would be a different setup than a gang or a bunch. Awesome. And then we've got Carter, who has a really wonderful question. Carter is wondering how to help cotton tops if you don't live inside Colombia. Okay. Well, you just uh, have an idea of you can support our program. You can go into and donate to Project T to support the, the work we do. We run on donations and grants 
So uh, we find partners all around the world to help uh, to engage with our work and to help with our work. You can purchase the products. You can help the communities by purchasing uh, products. And something else you can do all together is just be responsible with your consumption. Reduce consumption of plastic. We don't really need to use so much plastic on a day-to-day -day basis. Buy products that are certified to be from sustainable sources. Buy uh, food that is uh, responsible. Um, and do not you know, have any wild animals as pets because that encourages traffic sometimes. Uh, I know some of the species is legal to have them as pets, not in Colombia, but uh, it shouldn't be like that. So uh, you can either help particularly our efforts by purchasing or donating, but you can also be a responsible citizen and, and use uh, environmental practices and uh, make sure that uh, you're responsible with that. That's an amazing way. Every bit helps. Sometimes you think about, you know, Mab, it's only me. No, I mean, it, if you think like that, millions of people can think like you. And if we all give a little, then we'll surely uh, build something, something that is uh, significant and it makes a huge difference. And, and uh, even though cotton tops are only in Colombia, the, the reason we like to communicate this uh, to all different audiences is because all of our programs are replicable. You can, you can use the same approach for many different species and from many different environments. So maybe you can help in your community to support your wildlife and your ecosystems by using some of these ideas and also by leading some of uh, community action to benefit the environment. That helps you, helps your community, helps your country and help us all. That's amazing. Um, Gina on YouTube is wondering if their hair serves any purpose. Do we have any ideas <laughs> as to why they grew that, that awesome look? I think, I think they, it's, it's like a mating thing. And also there is something that, that they do when they are defending their territory. They really spur up like that. And they make them, I think it's called pilo erection. So their hair sticks up like that. So it makes them look bigger and a little scarier for any, even for any other group of cotton tops or any threat or any animal that wants to invade their territory. So I think it's a matter of, of just having a lot of hair to spur up and make you look bigger and scarier because you're a very territorial animal that defends their territory and fights for his life. Amazing. We've got a student online who's wondering if there's anything that surprised you in your research of cotton tops. <clears throat> no, I, I think the what what um, what touched me very deeply is the fact that they're only found in my country. Because when I grew up, I grew up here in Barranquilla. Barranquilla is in the north region of Colombia. And I never learned about cotton tops, never saw it in the science classes, never saw it in, in the school. I grew up without knowing that, that it, it existed. And then when I started working at the zoo, this is when I learned about cotton top tamarinds. And, and, and I thought that was, that was amazing that first, I didn't know anything about it growing up here. And second, that they were critically endangered and we weren't doing anything about it. So that was a huge motivator for me, and um, and and it became this this whole uh, life project to make sure that they thrive because they're unique. And and again, it's not only the monkeys; it's, it's an ecosystem, it's people. So yeah, and I gotta tell you guys, I I was not trained on science. I was trained as an architect of all things. And I came to the zoo because I got a master's degree in landscape architecture and I came to work at the zoo to redesign the exhibit. And I fell in love with cotton tops, became the zoo director, learned about productivity and decided to forget about architecture and dedicate my life to protecting this uh, Colombian monkey. So I've been doing this for 15 years now. I forgot about architecture. Amazing. So cool. Never too late to, to switch no. interests or, or take a new path. So no. lovely. I would like to, to build on that, Celeste, because, because sometimes you think that, that uh, it's only coming from the sciences that you can be an explorer or that you can be 
uh, become a conservationist or uh, an environmental leader. You can, you can come from any different sciences and they all have something to help the environment. Uh, you can be an environmental lawyer, you can be an environmental communicator, you can be you know, a scientist, you can be a biologist, you can be a vet, you can be, everything helps. So guys, don't get discouraged if you don't, you know, if you want to find your way into the environment from a different direction, do it. Everything adds and everything helps and you can certainly become any kind of leader that helps the environment and conservation of wildlife. What amazing advice. Rosemir, do you have any other last advice that you'd like to leave our young explorers with today? Just, I, 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 yes, I would like to share with you guys that, that passion and, and motivation is what takes you to the place where you want to be. Just be passionate. Just, just uh, find what you like and do it. You know, just go for it. Because, uh, because when you when you live and do your your day to day with passion, with motivation, with love, you never feel like you're working. You never, you know, you have lots of fun, and you feel happy because what you're doing is contributing to make a better world for all of us. So find your passion, go for it, uh, and make it happen. We all can. We all can. So I'll encourage you to do that and and uh, and to put your little grain of salt into making this a better planet for all of us. Love that. Such wonderful advice. Well, thank you so much for, for your time today, Rosamir, for that amazing presentation, for, for bringing cotton top tamarinds into so many new hearts and minds. Yes. Uh, for everyone out there watching, check out Ned Geo's uh, amazing <laughs> educational resources at geoed.org. We've got tons of Explorer classrooms. We've got tons of other great stuff too. Uh, you can tune in at 2 p.m. tomorrow for our next event, America's Eroding Edges, a lesson on the current impact of climate change with National Geographic Explorer Victoria Herman. And before we go, I'd like to turn on all the microphones and nice and loud, let all the students up on screen say goodbye and thank you to Rosamira. Ready? <laughs> Bye. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.